Well, great. Well, thanks everybody for joining. We uh, hopefully, as we were just talking about, everybody's got a little energy left uh, for this last session uh, in the Hyperledger Global Forum for the 2021 session. Um, as Brian was just saying, he was, hopefully everybody was able to hear that 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 they did in fact save the best for last um, with this hosted discussion uh, with talking about experience with Open IDL to build industry wide applications. So. This is a discussion, we're certainly uh, open for questions uh, discussion. Um, as I go through the presentation, I don't think I can see the, the chat board, so I'll try and uh, take some some stops in here, please, uh, if you can use audio or chime in, uh, get my attention. I'm happy to enter for questions as well as translations um, as we go between uh, insurance jargon uh, and technology jargon. But hopefully at this point, we're here for a couple of very specific things to, to start building and really start delivering uh, on the promise of, of blockchain and Hyperledger. Um, and be able to do that in a big fashion, be able to go industry wide. Um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to just have a good discussion here and understand from our experiences and what we've done to get to that point uh, and how, how, how we think Open IDL can help a lot of the other initiatives that we saw um, over the course of the last couple of days. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Truman Esmond. Uh, you can hit me on email, you can hit me on Twitter. Um, I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn as well. Just uh, reach out to me and let me know you're a human um, and I'd be happy to connect and see what we can do together. Uh, my primary job is I'm the Vice President of Membership and Solutions at AAIS. A bit about AAIS um, is that we're a not-for-profit association of member insurers. Um, so we're kind of a natural uh, consortium. We've been around for almost 90 years. Uh, we are a licensed intermediary for data um, for the United for the property casualty insurance market in the United States. That's homeowners auto, um, all the insurance that's not health insurance or life insurance. Pretty much everything else falls under uh, PNC. Um, my job as the VP of membership and solutions is to engage our member insurers, um, work with them directly to understand their their pain and uh, and their opportunity, um, and build solutions both within AEIS, uh, helping our, our carriers our member insurers do the same thing and then more broadly to fulfill our mission for the insurance industry which leads us to open idl um, uh, with hope for open idl i serve as the uh, lead architect and i'm also the chair since joining the linux foundation um, of the technical steering committee um, open idl is, stands for the open insurance data link um, you'll often hear me reference it as the open information data link uh, as, we, as open idl moves beyond insurance but the first thing that we have today is a regulatory reporting data network. Uh, and that's the part that we're going to be able to leverage uh, and start to build more industry-wide applications, both for insurance uh, and, and far beyond. So with that, I'm going to start with a quick why of open IDL um, with blockchain technologies and really any sorts of uh, efforts like this. It's critical to start with the why and the purpose first. Do hopefully a five-minute architecture overview, seeing uh, how the, the network, the types of nodes, the what's inside a node and how the network works itself. Uh, and we'll look at that through three different application examples uh, that we've used for, for open IDL, looking at the data flows, how it uh, reinforces privacy, the sorts of logic, a uh, bit about how the UIs interact um, and the work underway. And we're gonna do that through three examples uh, that we have today. One is the nine state COVID-19 uh, proof of concept uh, we just completed, uh, as well as regulatory reporting uh, using uh, auto, uh, as well as uh, flood and catastrophe uh, response, which is an emerging threat as we deal with uh, growing issues like climate change and things like that. Um, and then as we look beyond, we want to make sure we hit on the industry-wide applications and how you as a Hyperledger developer or a technical constituency can leverage Open IDL now as a Hyperledger, uh, excuse me, the Linux project uh, to uh, to build upon for industry-wide applications and maybe leveraging solutions you may have already uh, built leveraging Hyperledger. So, the purpose of open IDL and the real reason is here, and I want to make sure we start with the uh, the, the takeaways first, uh, so that in case uh, we run out of time or we get into deeper discussions, uh, discussions I, I do have a tendency to go down rabbit holes. Um, but it's really important to understand that open IDL is a mechanism that allows us to ask and answer very important questions. Um, the community is ready and open for business. A lot, the Linux Foundation, uh, now that it's official, um, you can go to the website, uh, look at our the wiki, join the uh, social net, the social uh, forums and Slack, um, and then hit us up on Git uh, and look at the repositories and test out the uh, the reference code that is uh, that is out there uh, and it is currently being developed. Um, like I said, it's now a Linux Foundation project. The technology is stable. The underpinnings um, have been uh, pretty stable for the better part of a year. And the key thing that we are providing with OpenIDL is true data privacy and information delivery 
through the Linux Foundation Governance Networks, of which OpenIDL is uh, fits right in that that strategy. The key difference, uh, or the key differentiator of OpenIDL, is the regulatory connection through property casualty insurance and the property and risk of that allows us to connect uh, a lot of other things that we have up in the air and in the marketplace to go forward. Quick introduction to AIS, I won't read this to you, but uh, it's as a consortium or as a uh, association of insurance companies, we serve three functions that we are actually licensed by each state uh, as insurance is state-based to, to do. First thing is a statistical agent. Uh, and we, at that role, we aggregate information, anonymize it, that, are, that it is supplied to us by our member carriers. Uh, we, you know, we summarize that uh, and then distribute that in the form of data reports to the state regulators. Uh, so with that, so it's all the data is kept anonymous uh, and they've got a general understanding of what's uh, from a pricing perspective and coverage perspective, what is fair, what is adequate, um, and making sure the industry is not being unfairly discriminatory uh, and people are getting what they pay for with respect to insurance as a regulated market. Beyond that, we have a couple of important functions. Um, as a rating bureau, we take that data, we also reflect it back to the industry. So it's a limited antitrust exemption, um, essentially providing the cost of goods sold for insurance to allow new products to be developed as well as experience to be um, absorbed by the industry. Uh, and then we're an advisory organization to build actual insurance products on that as standard uh, for homeowners, auto, business owners, things like that, so that the industry is better prepared to, to offer uh, risk transfer mechanisms um, in, uh, in where there may be less experience uh, in the marketplace. So the challenges to our mission in terms of providing those functions is that uh, we've got some really recurring problems. Uh, as data owners, it's critical to keep that data private and in their control. Uh, as we are seeking, information seekers are knowing, are seeking more and more detailed data, more and more frequent, da frequent data, that, that privacy issue is increasingly important. And, and as a result, in order to get to the quality and the needs, we need to make sure that the purpose uh, and the people playing in that uh, situation are aligned around that purpose and the goals of that network data. And building open IDL, we hit a couple of key things in the development, you probably heard uh, reflected over the course of the last few days, uh, requiring collaboration and empathy across stakeholders who typically don't work together, who definitely don't trust each other, and we're talking about regulators and insurance companies. And then establish a community, which is you know, a network, but a network for a particular purpose, in this case for regulatory reporting, and then establishing those standards, the rules that everybody agrees to work by, and then a transparent governance mechanism that allows those rules to be changed over time. And then of course, being allowing that to be delivered on an open technology platform, which of course we have uh, with the Hyperledger fabric, fabric uh, as a foundation. So that allowed us to build open IDL that gave some really critical features for the stakeholders, namely insurers, uh, data privacy, uh, and they, they see a solution to the trajectory of regulatory reporting and really a mechanism for an external data strategy across the industry. Regulators have an opportunity to get much more reliable, timely, uh, and enhanced information so that they can develop more responsive um, and more effective policy for their job about fairness, adequacy, and, and uh, and, and discrimination. And AIS is the intermediary. We can actually do our job far better. We can stop moving, stop storing data, delivering information faster, and ability to serve more of the industry in a way that'll give us the new experiences that we like. Um, and as, as I often say, uh, so we can get to flying cars. So I'll stop really quick and see if there's any questions. Give me one second and I'll uh, check on that. Uh, doesn't look like it yet, so I'll keep going until somebody interrupts me. But let me get uh, pick up the cover a little bit and talk about the architecture uh, and data flows. So the as you mentioned, the, the network serves three major roles. The network governance role, it serves in this, in this initial case with uh, AEIS as the statistical agent, enforcing our current responsibilities today. Data owners, in this case, the insurers, um, who are deploying data to their own peer, that data remains private and secure. Um, and again, it's important to understand that the data that while it's deployed to the peer, the data itself is not on the network, on the blockchain or on the ledger. Only the evidence of that data being present and having gone through the requirements uh, to be uh, to be used for the purposes of regulatory reporting. And then the information seekers, in this case, the state regulators who are preparing the data calls, the questions they'd like to ask of the network um, that are those transparent governed interactions with that data. And then when, when they issue those data calls, carriers can agree to them and permit those trusted interactions uh, and the information seekers, the state regulators get assurance that that data, the information that they're getting is based on uh, the actual real information that was present in the system that uh, maintains integrity. 
So we look at what's happening on each of the clusters or each of the nodes uh, in the uh, OpenIDL network um, is based on Kubernetes, a series of clusters providing services um, that are all tightly linked or, and trusted to provide uh, a suite of services, what we call OpenIDL in a box. Um, first and foremost is the Hyperledger uh, fabric uh, peer, uh, including the private data collection, which we leverage for, pretty extensively, and we'll talk about that. Then the application cluster, which provides the, the user interface that the humans interact to uh, con consent to data calls uh, and, and issue draft and issue them. And then the applications underneath the hood, the insurance data manager, which brings the data in, the smart contracts that, that bring the data in usable for regulatory reporting. And then the data call processor, um, which is the extraction patterns that brings the data, that leverages the data for uh, reporting. And then the open IDL data call app, which is the framework uh, that, that deploys those things. Essentially, that is the, the chain code and the smart contracts. There's an additional cluster uh, for ETL. Um, as we're talking regulatory reporting, we are talking, um, you know, often hundreds of gigabytes of data uh, on a monthly or quarterly basis. So we've got a robust ETL process that can be varied depending on the, the needs of the particular node, um, and that exists in a, in a trusted cluster. And then we've got different applications that uh, that pro provide the different services that may be cloud dependent, like certificate managers or, or application security protocols, uh, as well as the actual data stores themselves. In this case, uh, we're using uh, MongoDB for the, for the carrier nodes. Let me dig under the hood a little more to get the idea of what technologies serve uh, those different components. Uh, they are all designed to be uh, replaceable um, by the different deployment and the need of the of that particular node. Um, as mentioned, using MongoDB uh, for the harmonized data store, uh, which is a, a key component, that data that uh, is known to be of a, a have met the guidelines of the community for regulatory reporting. Um, that could be other data stores in an, in an analytics node. It might be uh, Oracle or something like that. Um, we talk about the harmonized data store extraction and logic. You know, MapReduce could be simple SQL queries. Uh, it could also be uh, syndicated logic that we might deploy as chain code or as, uh, as trusted applications as part of the network. Um, that's similar to those data transformations. Um, we started with NiFi. We've also leveraged uh, different implementations for our reference implementation, as well as for AAIS's own use uh, that allows us to scale uh, and, and be you know, much more, uh, uh, a much higher degree of service and throughput. Um, application levels, Node.js for the user interfaces, and of course, uh, Hyperledger Flab Fabric, uh, using IBM blockchain platform for some management efficiencies, uh, but uh, ultimately, uh, it's uh, the Fabric node that's really the critical component and, and really just the uh, key included features, uh, including the private data collection of Hyperledger that we built on for OpenIDL. When those nodes are deployed, it, it, it uh, looks a bit like this in the, in, across the network. There's really three types of nodes that are out there. Um, starting, at the, starting at the bottom, we've got carrier nodes who are the data owners. Each carrier would deploy uh, a node or nodes that allow them to contain the, their referential data and their own harmonized data stores. AEIS deploys a multi-carrier node or multi-tenant node. This allows us to serve our traditional capacity where we're reporting on behalf of companies who provide us data directly uh, and we can participate um, in our trusted capacity using a multi-tenant node, but they can still get all the benefits uh, of the broader network um, in, a, in a much uh, more facilitated way to participate. And then there's the analytics node, and this is the destination of the data that um, is retrieved from each of the data calls from each of the private data collections on the node. Um, and then as that data is output and visualized, that could be visualized on a workbook, uh, a Tableau workbook, for example, uh, resident on that node, or the output data could be delivered through a more traditional uh, or you know, what we might call legacy mechanisms in today's uh, insurance regulatory reporting world. How it generally works is a, is a two-phase commit. The carriers are loading data to their nodes on a periodic basis, might be daily, weekly. Um, we ask for at least be monthly, and that data is high resolution. It's got key data points in there like address and primary keys, uh, but it's completely private, completely within the, reg in the uh, carrier's control. On the other side of the field, regulators are creating data calls, questions they would like to ask the industry to help them build policy to understand what's happening in the market. They create those data calls and then publish them over the over the open IDL network to carriers um, and is issue them uh, for their participation. As carriers agree to participate in those, consent, not in a, in a uh, consensus thing, but they agree to participate in those. Those transparent interactions with their data are executed, harmonized, anonymized and uh, de-identified data 
um, is delivered to the analytics peer and ultimately to the regulator, allowing integrity transactions to occur at each step, ensuring that the resulting information provided to the regulator uh, has provenance and traceability all the way back to the uh, to the source data. But the real key thing for carriers to participate in this is that carriers maintain control. Carrier identified or address level data or any really any data they don't choose to never leaves company control, never leaves the network. Uh, they have control over all of the ingestion, storage, and transformation operations, leveraging trusted code with integrity verified through the network. Uh, and those and all of it is transparent. So there's no there's no surprises and and there's no opportunity uh, for them to be uh, identified uh, at the back end of it and having their their experience uh, come back to haunt them. So walk through a data call really quick and about actually how it works um, in terms of how each person or individual participates uh, in the role. As you mentioned, carriers upload data into their local harmonized data store and their node. Uh, and at the same time, regulators are creating data calls, drafting data calls. Um, carriers can log into their user interface and, and like or unlike those data calls, indicating the, uh, the likelihood that the industry would respond favorably should that uh, come into play. Using online, offline mechanisms, they may uh, incorporate feedback and regulators may issue multiple drafts of that data call. When they're satisfied, they can issue that data call to the market. Um, it's not quite ready yet because the stat agent, in this case, AEIS, but in the future really could be any uh, organization that would develop the extraction pattern that would actually be the code that interacts and queries that data across those carriers um, that does the tra data transformation and the input for the report. That extraction pattern, that code is actually attached to the data call, uh, logged within the ledger so that there's nothing, there's no way for any other code but that to be run uh, when it comes time. Carriers can then review that data call and see that extraction pattern. And if they're satisfied the test runs, they see how their data is gonna respond and they're willing to do it, they can consent to that data call. At that point, the system executes the extraction pattern, sends the result to the analytics node using the private data collection. That information uh, is, is sent to the statistical agent, in this case, AAIS, uh, where we run additional quality and ultimately deliver the report to the state regulators in whatever mechanisms they prescribe. Let's pop up in the hood of the extraction pattern because this is really where the rubber hits the road and where uh, we say we're really starting to play with some sharp objects um, and that we're, we're looking at data and dealing with data with trusted interactions to very sensitive data. Um, it could be, you know, for PNC insurance, it's things like address, um, maybe location information, um, as well as uh, coverage information, claims experience. Uh, but as this grows into other insurance mechanisms, it could easily be uh, much more PII. So as a carrier consents to it, the, they consent to the data call, uh, and that is obviously logged onto the ledger. Um, the regulators are aware of an additional consent. They don't know who, who actually performed the consent. That extraction pattern uh, is retrieved from the ledger to make sure that there's nothing other than what was approved that, uh, that is executed. And then the extraction pattern is run against the harmonized data store, again, on the carrier node in the, con in the context and control of the carrier um, and they can have a big an engine that's run as fast as they want, or they can uh, run it at whatever their, their pace is. In addition, we have the opportunity at this point to not just query the data, but we can actually run additional applications and decorate that data relating it using those key fields or private data or even internal data stores uh, to things like the payroll protection program. Uh, in this case, we'll, in our first example, we'll talk about how we related uh, private data, which is policy record, to a loan business loan application record uh, through the through that address and uh, how that was able to be really uh, really powerful then once that uh, that functionality is performed the data is extracted and then matched and performed decorated appropriately to using uh, related to to other data stores that is in, is placed in the private data collection uh, and then is replicated to the analytics node the data is ultimately delivered uh, to in this case the statistical agent on the analytics node, we do additional quality checks uh, and then it can provide a delivery mechanism into a reporting database, uh, potentially a Tableau uh, UI or report or a, a data set output. So we talk about uh, really the purpose today, of the industry-wide applications, of how do we leverage this moving forward uh, and talk about a couple of the applications. Uh, the first one was the COVID-19 business interruption uh, data call that we performed. Uh, Obviously, regulators had a keen interest in as they were issuing policies to close down businesses um, of what kind of interruption or what kind of uh, impact that was going to have on their small businesses. You know how, you know how 
were bills going to get paid, how were payroll, was payroll going to be met? Um, and they did a data call that gathered some high level information about policy and premium and COVID-19 related claims and losses. Um, well, the insurance industry had long ago recognized that pandemics and viruses and things like that were um, generally excluded from typical process. They only happen once in a hundred years and the costs would be uh, you know, disproportionate to the potential value for that. So uh, those are typically excluded risks. So the initial data call that was issued indicated that there was very little coverage out there for uh, for pandemic risks and business interruption uh, and virtually no claims were, were paid as a result. Um, we, we had nine states, including California, Texas, uh, Maryland, Virginia, North Dakota, Connecticut, um, New Jersey, um, uh, do a, uh, a proof of concept issuing the same data call using OpenIDL. This allowed us to leverage data that was already available in the marketplace, not do it as a one-off query of the industry, but leverage information that we captured from statistical data and then augment that data using the private uh, the data privacy capabilities of OpenIDL to add some keys to that. So we can now associate claims to policies where we couldn't before. We had a bucket of policies and a bucket of claims and they weren't associated because of course that would indicate a particular policy experience, very proprietary and enterprise information. And we also uh, were able to decorate the policies with a policy address. Again, something that's very private. Um, historically, we would have zip code level information, but now we can get it at the street level. Um, and then be able to keep that fresh. And through those associations, we were able to connect the policy street address to the payroll protection database and answer and definitively understand the question of the gap between how, how many loans business owners took out to replace their payroll, even though they had business interruption insurance that wouldn't have covered the risk. And what it shows is the dramatic gap um, in payroll uh, payroll loans, take PPP loans taken out, um, and relative to the premium paid by the industry for business interruption, and there was just not enough premium being paid to remotely close that gap. But it gives us a mechanism from a regulatory perspective to connect that and close that gap so that good policies can be made, encouraging good behavior. So that's really a powerful one uh, that just completed, uh, and we're finalizing the, the major report for that. But the, the whole reason this was built is for, for cases like that, but really for the day-to-day -day business of regulatory reporting. Um, and as we mentioned, uh, what AI has created was the regulatory reporting data model, um, which replaces a highly complex uh, and, and variable system um, for regulatory reporting across the PNC industry. Carriers have to respond to uh, 1,600 uh, of these data calls, including the annual uh, reporting things they have to do just for doing that sort of business in, in a particular state, um, and more and more are being created every day. Uh, that, that hairball in the upper right-hand corner of the slide represents the, the data model that indicates all the different data that uh, is necessary by all the different data calls that are issued, because each state issues their own, even though they're asking the same questions, they do it different ways, um, necessitating a carrier to respond very, very tactically. Uh, our regulatory reporting data model flipped that around. We looked at all the data calls that were being issued, boiled down the data architecture and created a model such that if a, if a carrier ingested the data uh, for the regulatory reporting data model that touches most of the content areas of, of uh, an insurance business, they can now do regulatory reporting essentially at the click of a button. Um, and, and that model uh, is changed through mechanisms in the industry that are uh, permitted today in order to do that. Again, keeping data private, and allowing a much more streamlined flow of information as well as uh, products and benefits to reporting carriers for, for in terms of benchmarking as well as collaborative products. Uh, there's some great opportunities there uh, and the, really the first big value proposition is uh, operational efficiency. Uh, we have some companies that are uh, looking at you know, reducing, you know, again, uh, you know, 900 or so processes and removing, you know, potentially 90 or so steps in those processes. Um, and we're able to put a very fine uh, number on those to see what sort of internal efficiencies can be gained uh, when enterprises take advantage of open IDL. Then we start to get into the, the future cases um, and what are we going next? Uh, and we, one of the big um, challenges we've had as an insurance industry is certainly flood and catastrophe and, and the changing risk environment uh, and, and the need to get far more precise in terms of our management of those risks. You know, we know where water is going to go when it comes down, uh, for example, using these models and incorporating data providers, uh, third, you know, third party uh, aggregators, uh, machine learning tools, 
um, and even uh, data owners or data providers in an automated way like IoT devices, uh, building a model for those allows regulators a, a mechanism to, to not only leverage those tools like models that they might, have, they might not have been able to afford otherwise, um, and they can start to get the very specific value out of those to understand what their risk looks like on the first day of hurricane season, or as uh, as two of our uh, initial members, uh, Cat Risk and RMS, are two uh, leading uh, flood and catastrophe models in the industry uh, proposed, is allowing them specific potential access to those models so they understand the risk, can develop policies and mechanisms to collaborate with the industry to both mitigate and respond uh, to that risk to help uh, those those events uh, become less impactful, and those include you know new uh, uh, building construction codes, for example, uh, as well as infrastructure to uh, help uh, mitigate and uh, and respond in a collaborative way. So that's really important. And then as the as those type types of cases uh, work through, regulators are already seeing they are that they have data owners as well. They have rich experience that has been reported in the past. They have lots of information uh, in the, across their networks that uh, for licensing, whether it's Department of Motor Vehicles and Transportation, you know, street maintenance, um, as well as permitting that they do for everything for pilots to, to home daycares. All of those data stores um, need to be connected and are of, of value valuable back to the insurance industry as well um, as we get to these you know, more regulatory dashboards and more dynamic policies that will, again, allow us to get to flying cars where the interactions and the risk context needs to be changed through the interaction of trusted systems without sharing, like one car might do, uh, 40 terabytes of data in the course of a day. Again, keeping the data in control, keeping it proprietary and, and uh, the way it needs to be done for execution and trusted for a purpose connected to the regulatory environment so that we can actually get some of these things done. So as we go beyond what we're doing today, we certainly have lots of other working groups going, but hopefully everybody's able to see how this, this fundamental ecosystem, you know, is, is this really baseline privacy technology can facilitate all the different applications we've seen, uh, you know, that are leveraging Hyperledger today, but also how OpenIDL is a fundamental uh, uh, technology again, and, and community uh, to, and through OpenIDL to do, or through Linux Foundation to do, network of networks and governance networks allow us to develop immediate industry-wide applications for within the insurance industry, supporting uh, specific processes and new stakeholders like reinsurers and agent networks, as well as those uh, data providers. Um, the enterprise deployments for dramatic efficiencies within organizations, as well as mechanisms to integrate their enterprise data strategy with that of the external data strategy so they can start to really do some, some real uh, technical investment uh, for the enterprise and their own purpose and leverage product verticals so they can start to integrate that will allow, uh, you know, across the industry or for particular uh, policyholder or customer experiences that will be broadly impactful and then require those regulatory inroads, uh, pun intended, uh, for them to be involved and allow the broader impact that we know uh, distributed ledger technologies can provide, including the things the regulators need to be accountable for, like smart roads and uh, street maintenance, um, and rules around when we can have autonomous vehicles and, and flying cars based on weather um, or other other factors. Beyond that, OpenIDL is at a point ready for uh, you know, to start inter being introduced to other communities and, and networks, insurance related or not. As I say, often everything is related to insurance at one degree or another, uh, but the uh, but the underlying technology allows communities to start to establish themselves and set the boundaries of their purpose, and then OpenIDL allows them to interoperate. Uh, for the purpose of, of of completely new experiences and value across these communities of untrusted stakeholders. So getting started, um, learn and join. Um, join a, uh, Linux Foundation, and most folks are already there. Um, join OpenIDL for the uh, in the community. Start to uh, to to get uh, to get to get busy. We've got all kinds of resources out there. We mentioned on Git, on the wiki, um, and of course on the website. And I invite you to please reach out to me and anybody at, at uh, AIS, uh, the Linux Foundation, uh, to help you get started. So with that, I will stop sharing and if we have some, and get to some questions.
Fantastic. All right. And any questions come through? I'm trying to get to my Q and A thing here. Let's see. <laughs> no, just turning on to give you some moral support as well. Uh, you. Uh, you know, we, we uh, had a couple people in the audience. I don't know. Anyone have any questions? I mean, I I'll, I'll just say I first heard about this uh, about actually at the last Hyperledger Global Forum is where Truman and Joan and I met and we started talking about other ways that the Linux Foundation could help with this project, help with uh, open sourcing of the project, and help with a bit of the governance model for it as well. And so we've been working with them to, to to put this project together and roll it out, and 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 so it's live now. Um, uh, oh, it looks like there is a question in the Q and A. Yes. Oh, yep. Let me see. Go for it. Yes. Uh, reg regulatory compliance monitoring uh, and regulator bodies to get on board with them and blockchain in the first place. Actually, uh, it's a great question. Um, regulators have been. Uh, actually very on board with this as they recognize the challenge they have and, and the fights they kind of pick with the industry when they're trying to get new information. And the COVID-19 data call is a great example of that. Um, and that they're, you know, we're starting, as I said, to start to play with some sharp objects. We're getting near some sensitive areas when we talk about, um, you know, area, you know, things that, you know, paying claims on a broad basis that uh, are, are very touchy for, for insurance companies. And for compliance, that's actually you know our role as AEIS and where this is going um, to have objective rules for compliance that allow those and allow those rules to change, get faster, get more detailed. Um, and regulators see the the opportunity there, as we mentioned. That we've got uh, they're they're actually kind of pushing the envelope um, with our in our industry because uh, they're trying to they want to say yes, but they just need a mechanism to do so. And and what they're what they see with open IDL is an opportunity is a is a way to build that. It may, may not be there yet for flying cars, but you know, but there's a pathway to get there and that's what they see uh, to do so they can allow this start this activity. Um, but it's a paradigm shift. You know, and and actually, you know, blockchain. You know, while it's a, it's critical to the underlying technology. Actually, I had somebody say, um, it's actually starting to. We know it's going somewhere when it's being applied to very boring use cases. <laughs> and this this that's what this is. This is, uh, you know, a, a process that's been going forever. But at the end of the day, it's how regulators allow new risks to be taken when there's a risk transfer mechanism. You know, again, they're not going to allow flying cars, two thousand pounds of metal, flying around over a city you know, until they can permit that and they know that if an aerial wheel falls off, uh, it's going to be okay. And there's a mechanism that, you know, and it's not just going to get, get fought about in court and people are going to get made whole quickly. Um, and that's what we need to do for all these different things that are changing. Cyber, great example, you know, securing our pipelines and food supply, maybe. <laughs> maybe uh, if I could add a little bit, uh, Truman, um, you know, as we look at uh, the use of blockchain technology, uh, there's the technology itself, which we have a lot of control over. Um, then there's the communities that we need to build with the technology, which are that's harder to do. You have to bring that community together. Um, and then if you're in a regulated industry like the insurance industry, um, you do need to bring the regulators to the table as well. And we have been collaborating with the regulators um, all along. And the uh, example that Truman gave earlier around the COVID-19 data call, uh, the, the regulators really do want to move in this direction where they can begin expanding how we bring data together. How do we bring that closely held private information that, that companies have? It could be a bank, it could be an insurance company. How do we link that to new data sources? Um, and get to uh, an understanding of what's going on in, in a market that we just can't do it with the data, the way we've collected data in the past. So the regulators have been a very active participant and there was a law, no, a legislation passed in North Dakota uh, about two months ago where they allocated funding to continue looking at using um, open IDL is a way to solve really uh, some serious problems in states such uh, as uninsured motorists, which cost good motorists a lot of money because for those who aren't insured, it costs all of us some money and, and it's a, a pressing issue for the regulators. So um, I think that's a really important point um, that we have to have the regulators there. The other part is that um, there are millions of dollars a year spent um, on all sorts of market conduct and financial auditing by the government. 
And OpenIDL is a platform that enables that to be automated. And instead of sending large blocks of data to a regulator, just a simple dashboard was would be all that would be needed. So th that's why, again, to echo what um, Truman said, come join the OpenIDL project because it's more than just regulatory reporting. There are many possibilities uh, of extending this platform to do more than regulatory reporting. And, and, and uh, regulatory reporting in all kinds of different ways, again, given a way to, to say yes and allow all these things that we want to do. Get me off the roads. Have the regulators had uh, heart attacks when you've used the word blockchain uh, uh, at them? Uh, uh, okay, good. No, no. Some do. Um, you know, what really perks them up, though, is what we're able to show them because the industry protects um, itself from discrimination. So things like, you know, really sensitive things like race, income levels, um, and, and, you know, geographic disparity are kept at arm's length, which makes it very different, difficult for regulators to, to see if those things are, are happening correctly. Um, but they, you know, that's the, you know, the, the conundrum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think, you know, when they would kind of to clarify your question, Brian, in terms of the technology itself, um, I, I don't think they're concerned about it and they're even less concerned when they understand it's not about cryptocurrency. It's a different type of blockchain technology. Exactly. Um, but we've seen that that even if they don't really understand the technology, they understand the potential to unlock uh, information, not data, mm -hmm. but information. They do see that. And we've had great partners. There were eight state commissioners that joined in and supported the COVID-19 data call. Nine. That's, yeah, or nine. Okay. Almost, and almost 10. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, that's for a state regulator to pay attention and say we support this, um, you know, it, it, it is important to them. No matter what the technology, that what we were trying to accomplish, that's what was really important to them. Yeah, because we're going to need them to change the laws, right? Because how they do regulatory mm -hmm. reporting, the requirements that they need, that they put on an industry, and how that industry responds is is at least policy, if not actual law. So it, it's not something that happens overnight, and it's kind of a yes and thing. We all the things we're doing now with Open IDL that are really cool, we still have to do the old way to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and that's a good point. I think, uh, again, for for all of the uh, groups that are participating in the building of these types of um, applications, it's uh, there are many things we can imagine that we would like to do. But for many of them in regulated industries, we can only do them if the regulators understand what we're doing. They, for those things that are important to them, a fair, um, open, transparent marketplace. They need to come along with us uh, because we can do great things with technology, but then get, you know, stops short because yep. they have no insight into it. And a good uh, example of that is catastrophe models, which have been in the Absolutely. insurance industry for a long time, but they're black boxes. And the state said, no, we cannot approve the use of these as just black boxes. We have to look under the cover and make, make sure we really understand what you're doing and that it's fair to the consumer. So the same yep. is true here with the, with the exchange of information. Jennifer, feel free to share your audio and video and come on if you want to yep. uh, yeah. ask other questions too. Um, it's good to hear that you're working in uh, the same space, that it resonates. Uh, uh, it sounds like you're somewhere between uh, water utility control and uh, critical infrastructure, cybersecurity infrastructure. Certainly a hot topic since the uh, the pipeline hacks and, and other things that have happened. So um, uh, uh, anyways, feel free to, to ask more questions as well. I see another one from Iwana. Um, could the models for climate change evolve soon? How, where do you think this does plug into um, how risk uh, uh, and, and well, how, the models for like where weather ha events happen, you know, both in the macro and the micro, um, but but how does this get maybe to things like parametric insurance and, and those mm -hmm. sorts of things? Yeah, uh, the first thing it'll do is start to do parametric experiences, you know, to, you know, for uh, communication efforts, for example, it may not be paying claims, you know, or necessarily creating a whole bunch of first notice of losses, which means there's a whole bunch of claims that might get paid, but start to do some things like, oh, you know, we know that this policy is here. We know this weather is there. We can send notifications like batten down the hatches. Here's some sandbags, you know, things like that. That'll happen more parametrically, even if it's not actually underwriting, issuing insurance or paying claims, but those will come as we get, you know, more trust in the network uh, and more 
capability that the regulators will permit uh, on a on a broad, an increasingly broader scale basis, right? They'll allow different things in high risk areas, you know, for houses on stilts on the coast than they might allow, um, you know, in uh, in underserved areas in a, in an urban area, for example. I see Jennifer came online. Um, hi. Anything else you wanted to ask or comment on? Well, so, um, well, first, um, thank you for, for inviting me to, to be part of it. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm kind of in a unique position where, as you can see behind me, um, you know, I, I'm a water nerd. Like, I'm just kind of dipping my toe, for lack of better phrasing, um, down the, the rabbit hole of, of blockchain and, and the, the entire industry. Um, I've been in, in wastewater treatment for about 11 years now. And over the course of that time, I kept finding myself saying, there has to be a better way of doing this um, mm -hmm. when it comes to like the flow of information. Um, and uh, so I, I eventually uh, learned what blockchain was and I heard about the, the cryptocurrency part of it first. And I was like, okay, you know, that's, that's cool, yeah. but, <laughs> and then I heard about the supply chain management aspect. And I was like, oh, 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 that has that has potential. Um, so I started. We, um, my my utility um, had had some some issues going through with uh, actually our industrial users. So we um, every wastewater utility has stuff kind of sending them or um, industry sending them stuff, whether it be uh, you know residential, you know every everything that gets flushed down a toilet, swirled down a drain, you know, uh, chemical manufacturing, all that stuff gets washed down and sent to us for, for treatment. Nine times out of 10, everything's fine. Every once in a while at like three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday when no one is really here paying attention, we get something that just wipes us out. Um, it's, it's equivalent to, you know, a, a disaster situation. Um, you know, so in addition to all of the, the physical stuff that we have to do to prepare for that, there's also paperwork that that has to follow um primarily billing paperwork between the utility and the industrial user you know we have a hard copy contract with them right now where you know our attorneys kind of battle it out and come up with something where you know if it's if it's under this threshold limit you pay one fee if you exceed the threshold limit you pay another right now nobody trusts each other nobody if something happens nobody has any proof of it there's no way for for anybody to get financial compensation it's it's kind of a mess um so i kind of started thinking okay well you know I, I i had recently learned about you know blockchain technology and smart contracts and their their use cases in you know like walmart shipping and i was like now what if we could apply something like that to this and that's kind of how I, I got involved in this and, and learning about it. And that eventually kind of morphed into after the, the um, cyber attacks in February at the at the wastewater plant or at the water treatment plant down in Florida. And especially mm -hmm. after the, the pipeline hack, you know, cybersecurity in, in critical infrastructure has really come to the forefront of, of national headlines. And nobody likes making headlines for all the wrong reasons. Not that way, right. Exactly, <laughs> you know, so can we, again, apply that kind of supply chain management thought to water and by extension to basically all of critical infrastructure I mean, the, the, the industry is moving towards digitizing all of that stuff. Like you said, you know, with, with all of this paperwork floating around and with, with, you know, calling for information, can we streamline that? Can we digitize that? It could be That's the future insane. of truly smart and sustainable cities. Yep. And so most people around this point in my little spiel kind of think that I'm trying to develop Skynet. Um, mm -hmm. And I apologize in advance if it leads to a post-apocalyptic sci-fi series. But we can manage that too. See, that's the cool thing. Yeah. Right? We, can, we can manage AI using the same technology to prevent exactly. Got to. Yeah. But all, but also if we keep the human element at least somewhat involved, and if we do it smartly and through collaborative collaborative efforts like Hyperledger, you know, I, again, I'm I'm still learning all of this stuff. You know, as I go, I, I am I, I've taught through things like this, I, I've taught myself enough to like overall architecture kind of stuff. I know what needs to go in place. I am not a coder. I'm trying to find developers. Um, so shameless plug, if anybody's interested in trying to oh, create yeah. not Skynet Skynet, reach out to me. My LinkedIn profile is attached to my profile here. But you know, it, it's one of those things where this could work. We have to do it right. We have to do it smartly but it could really work and it could have so much potential benefit for the same reasons why it would benefit the, the insurance uh, industry. Yep. Well, those public private partnerships is really the critical piece, mm -hmm. right? You know, water yeah. infrastructure, energy infrastructure, 
you know, u- utilities, you know, from, uh, you know, again, as I mentioned street maintenance and things like that. We've got to have objective things that say, you know, you can, again, autonomous vehicles, you can drive on it when it's dry. You can't drive on it when it's wet. You can drive on it if the trees have been trimmed in the last month. You can't drive it if they have in, in the and the never more important than with water infrastructure, energy infrastructure, food supply, um, to have those collaborative mechanisms to because nobody wants, you know, we've been talking about a you know, romaine that seems so quaint now. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, now we're talking about, you know, gas lines and you know and uh you know, meat supply chains and of course water treatment, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, real time, you know, it's one thing being out of power, it's another thing having bad water go down the pipe. For sure. I, think, I mean, um, we work very closely with the National Fire Protection Association, which is an association for all the fire mm-hmm. protection professionals in the country. And they have echoed the same pain points that we were echoing around the sh- sharing of information. And you just described um, in your case as well, where you need to share information within uh, a lot of folks who don't trust one another, uh, but you have to work together yeah. and you have a lot of old manual processes and barriers to getting good information just because of the way it's being done. Um, in the case of the NFPA, they work for e- with every fire department in the country and they're using a wide range of um, systems to collect information. Um, and then it has to be, be moved up to this national repository um, with the open IDL they can continue to use those systems because they don't turn over in a, in a matter of months or even years very often, but they could put that data from the system that they trap it in today into the harmonized data store for open IDL. And then it's available to be linked to uh, federal data resources, NFPA data resources that they, they collect. And then they can, they can keep their data private because Again, the, the fire stations don't want to share all their information. So when <laughs> I, I get think it. about the, the problem that you just yep. described, each of the entities that you're working with, from the um, businesses that may send something into your water treatment facility by accident, for those who have to clean it up, for those of you who have to test or monitor or govern, each of you have your own systems, but you do have points where you want to connect that information together. So what the Open Ideal yeah. offers you is a way for those companies that are going to be nervous about collaborating with you um, and, and others that are maybe municipalities, go ahead and continue using the systems you've been using. Continue to keep your data private, but find a way to answer the question um, by by using the mechanisms of Open IDL. So w- within the network, only the existence of the data. We're here, we have the data available if you, if you need to query it. And then uh, each entity agrees to answer a question using a smart contract where the data is never stored on the network, but, but the ability to ask the question. So it's all about trust, right? You don't have trust, you mentioned that. There are, there's no trust between the parties. This enables uh, a first step. Go ahead, leave your data where it is. We know we don't trust one another. But if we do things this way, we can at least start to answer some questions together. Yeah. And even then it can be, you know, a jumping off point to future things where we are able to share that information. It's a good first step. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Great. Well, come join us. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Another great news case. Yep. Hey, uh, uh, looks like uh, we're I'm bit... figuring out my way through Hyperledger at the same time that I'm figuring out my way through blockchain in general. So yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we can um, help you. We're going in the same directions. Yep. Okay. Yeah, awesome. definitely. Well, it looks like we are just over time. Uh, so I uh, probably should wrap up with that. Um, I really thank you, Truman, for, for presenting uh, on the Open Ideal Vision. Uh, and uh, and this will, will be recorded and published online uh, in a little bit of time. I, I don't know that it's put up there instantly, but uh, it'll be put up there pretty soon. Um, so the world will be able to see. Uh, and uh, thank you all for coming. Any last thoughts or comments, June, Joan or, or Truman? I say thanks. Feel free to reach out. Anything we can do to help. I think we've we've got something that uh, can plug into pretty much everything we've seen this week. So I think we can help. Cool. Okay. Thank you all for attending. We'll see you Thank all you. next next year, hopefully in person. Yeah, right. Great. Or sooner. Right. Or thanks, sooner. Everyone. To a meet up near you, right? Yeah. <laughs>